Thank you, Jesus. We are going to read three scriptures today. I'm going to read Leviticus 23 from verse 26 to 32. We are going to read together slowly Isaiah 53. So everybody, we have Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Then I'm going to read on my own John 19. Thank you, Jesus. This is a wonderful day. Leviticus 23 from verse 26. Let me start from verse 23. 23 to 32. Because of time, I'll go ahead and read. Verse 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day, which starts evening today, of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls, meaning fasting, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement. Can you say the day of atonement? To make atonement for you before the Lord your God, for any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day who does not fast shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate the Sabbath. Evening to evening, you shall celebrate the Sabbath. We are going to read together in unison Isaiah 53. And we are going to do that as people who don't live in Russia. We are not going to be rushing. Are we on Isaiah 53? Let's read. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he has prolonged his days. Mm. 
therefore. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession. Hmm. Who is this person that Isaiah is talking about? Let me find John 19. Oh, this is so wonderful. I'm just going to read John 19 as long as I can read and just enjoy myself. Enjoy with me. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail! king of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you, that you may know that I found no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I found no fault in him. Then the Jews answered him, We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the platorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Then Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you is a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, you, If you let him go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Mm. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they buried him, they crucified him, and two others with him. One on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then men of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the King of the Jews but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified him, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lot on it, 
whose it shall be that the scripture may be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus before, therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put in hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, the word of the Lord. Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your holy name, we thank you, Lord, and we glorify your name. Your name is a strong tower. The righteous run to your name and they find safety in your name. We humble our hearts. We cast out, cast down our, our crowns to worship the only true king of glory, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the chief cornerstone that the world rejected, but he became the chief cornerstone. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Yeshua Hamashiach. We worship you. We humble our hearts. We humble our intellect. We humble our minds. We humble everything that we are to worship the only true living Jesus, the King of glory, the Redeemer of Israel, the Deliverer of humankind. We thank you and we bless your name. This morning I pray that speak, Jesus, speak through your spirit. Speak through me. It is not about me, for I did not die for anyone. It is you, your spirit, that speaks through us, oh, Father, so that you speak to us and to your children. Father, we pray that we are not going to resist the word when it is coming, oh, Lord, for your word is like a double-edged sword that pierces to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. We ask your spirit to speak to us, oh, Father, convince us, convict us unto repentance and wash us with your blood. Have mercy upon our lives, O Lord. Change our destiny, O Father, to your design and to your will. In the mighty name of Jesus, I soak everyone who's under my voice under the blood of Jesus. And I pray for your life and I pray for your destiny. Especially I pray for your soul and your spirit that you say yes to Jesus. You say yes to the Lord this morning in the name of Jesus. I pray for those who are worshiping with us, O oh Lord, through the live stream. I soak their homes. I soak their lives. I soak their destinies in the name and blood of Jesus. I pray that, Father, not even one is going to be lost. You are going to take all of us home. I accept the son of perdition. We thank you and we bless you and we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let me talk about the day of atonement, the atonement of our sins, the atonement of our, our sins. Today at sundown, starts the most important holiday in the Christian calendar, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. Of the seven feasts in the Bible, it was the one that God himself commanded to the children of Israel, that from sundown to the next sundown, you fast. It was a feast with a fast. God said to Moses in Leviticus 23, verse 29 to 30, that any person who does not fast in that day shall be cut off from his people 
and any person who works in that day, God will destroy him from among his people. In the other six feasts, God did not use the strong language and the strong verdict. He would only say, you shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Of course, with no requirement of fasting either. But on this particular day, the Day of Atonement, he spoke with the strongest terms, I want you to fast on this particular day from sundown to sundown. I think you know that the way that we count days uh, is a Roman concept which is not biblical. We count our day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. God has never counted days that way. If you go to the book of Genesis when he was created, when he was creating the earth and the world, he say, and it was the first day from evening to evening. So you see God still counting days the same way from sundown to sundown, from evening to evening. I wonder why God required the Israelites to take this day, this fasting, so seriously. To the extent that he says, whoever chose not to fast on this particular day, I'll cut him off. Meaning that I'll kill him, I'll destroy him. But before I get into today's preaching, let me share one of my dreams around 3 a.m. today about celebrating and worshiping the Lord, celebrating the Sabbath. I believe the dream was focusing something along those lines. I had a dream, and in the dream, it was Sunday morning. We left early, meaning me and my family, to go to attend a church service. The skies were very clear. The sun was just about to raise. The church service was an important one because it was a new beginning. I heard that in the dream. It was like a new year. We drove our car, our Toyota Camry smaller car. And as we drove for quite some time, we were driving towards the mountains. And we took the first turn towards the mountains. And we went uh, towards the mountain. And we started to ascend towards the mountain. There seemed to be two turns that goes to the mountain. Both of them, they were going to go to a church venue or to a church service. I knew about the second turn. But for some reason, I took the first turn in this dream. We drove for about 15, 10 to 15 minutes, climbing, navigating, going up the mountain. We arrived at a stage on the mountain where there was like a roadblock sort of place with police who were directing traffic. We arrived there just before the police had mounted that roadblock place, before they arrived so we passed that roadblock place and drove a few meters to up the mountain. But we arrived at a certain stage where the slope started to be more steeper, more steeper. I then realized that my car could have had time to navigate and climb the next level of the mountain, which was so steeper. Then I looked. There were stages of the mountain. We we're going to go that steep slope and there was kind of a flat place. After the flat place, you could go this way or this way to another flat place. So there were like stages, flat place stages going up. And I'm seeing this dream. And I came out of the car to view the mountain at this level where I realized that we cannot go any further because of the nature of the car that we were driving. It was not made to climb uh, the mountain. As I look around the mountain, it was so beautiful with many flatter places or stages where church gathering could gather and worship. It was just during that time when I was looking around the mountain and looking be below the mountain, the beauty and the greenery and everything, that um, two policemen came who were directing traffic. And they came and I talked with them. 
there were two white policemen and they were very friendly. They told me that the next slope uh, that I'm about to climb is too steeper. I may try, but they see that I may have a problem in trying to navigate that. So I had choices to worship at that level because it was flatter and wait for the gathering to come or to go down and go to the next tent. Remember, there were two tents that were going to the mountain, the one that I used to tend to. So I had those choices to take. And I felt so happy to receive the help from the police and to know what to do next, to know the options that I had. But I wished in my heart to have had an SUV or a Jeep that would size the mountain to go to the next level that I was supposed uh, to go where I was uh, going towards. The mountain, the dream ended when I was viewing the mountain still at that stage up, at that flatter level, wishing to have gone higher, but my heart was so much at peace at that level, seeing what I was seeing throughout the mountain and all the terrain and everything that was under the mountain. I had few key observations in my dream, as you also do. It was a Sabbath day. It was a new beginning, like a new year. We are in Rosh Hashanah right now, going to worship. That's what we were going to do with my family. As for me and my family, we have decided to worship the Lord. We were climbing a mountain, climbing a mountain. We were in a family car, a salon family car. We were reaching a road traffic where traffic is directed. It was a steep slope, and we reached even a steeper slope. There were police. There was help offered. And the dream ended while I'm still on top of the mountain, still wishing to go in elevation higher. These are things that you just see as you follow the dream. Mountain. Dreaming a mountain, a mountain represents a place to meet God. We talk of the mountain top experience. God came down at Mount Sinai and met Moses and Joshua and the children of Israel. Joshua and Moses, they climbed to the top of the mountain and met God. But all the children of Israel, they were at the edge of the mountain. When God came to Mount Sinai, his glory descended upon the mountain. There was a thick cloud. There were thunders and lightning and everything. It was showing that heaven had come on earth. Mountain can represent also a large obstacle, a large problem, opposition. It represents also faith. Jesus says, so you speak to this mountain using what? Faith to move. It can represent prayer. The children of God will say, come to the mountain and pray. Come to the mountain and meet me. Seeing things from heavenly perspective can represent an advantage. The level that I was, I could see the earth. I could see the terrain. I could see everything. But I wished to go higher where I could even have a better perspective. A mountain can represent stability. It can represent majesty. It can represent the kingdom of God. All this is from the scriptures. Matthew 21, 21, Psalm 72, 3, Mark 11, 23, Isaiah 2, 2, Daniel 2, 5, Jeremiah 51, 25, Zechariah 4, 7. All the, they are mentioning of mountains in the Bible. In this mountain, we're representing some of the things that I've just mentioned. Things that I've just mentioned. Climbing a mountain in a dream. Climbing a mountain may mean walking out a preparation process in order to have a God encounter or going to a higher level of spiritual understanding, going to a higher level of spiritual understanding. Increased elevation means fewer people are able to scale the steep inclines. Seeing these mountains in the dream have the following meanings. If you see a mountain and it's called in your dream Mount Ebal, it is the mount of cursing. There is a curse. 
Deuteronomy 27, verse 13. If you hear in your dream the mountain that you are seeing is Mount Gerizim, it is the Mount of Blessing. Deuteronomy 27, 13. If you see Mount Moria in your dream, it represents sacrifice or testing. Genesis 27, 22, 2. If you see Mount Sinai, it represents the law of the covenant. That's where the Torah, the Ten Commandments were given. If you see Mount Zion, it represents the power to rule, the new covenant, the priesthood, the throne of David, which Jesus came through the throne of David, worship and praise of David's tabernacle. So these specific mountains have specific meanings in the dream. I dreamt climbing a mountain and I reached a certain level with a vantage point, but I could not go further because of the type of the vehicle that I had. I'm not going to interpret the dream. I would want you just to process it, what the Lord is saying to the church. It had nothing to do with my family alone. It represents the church. During this period of the Feast of Tabernacle, with the Day of Atonement starting today at sundown, may God help us to have a God encounter. May he help us to have a higher level of spiritual understanding. May he help us to scale the steep inclines in understanding and worshiping him. May he remove every obstacle or opposition or large problem on our way so that we can go to the top of the mountain. We decree all this in the name of Jesus. Let me finish by talking about the atonement of our sins, today being a day of atonement of our sins. As early as Leviticus, the Lord spoke to Moses to tell the children of Israel that one day per year, one day per year, in the month of Tishrei, I want you to observe, I want you to celebrate as a memorial this day as the day of atonement. You were born and you have a birthday. And one day per year, you celebrate your birthday. Except if you grew up like me, who did not even know when is my birthday. And that day is special for you. It is an appointed time for you. You do everything that you can to celebrate. You WhatsApp your friends. You text everybody. You probably prepare something for your friends to come and rejoice with you because it is an important day. But it doesn't mean, therefore, that you cannot celebrate your life any other day. You can choose to. But there's a specific day that is earmarked for that. Your birthday. Your birthday. It's a day, the day of atonement is a day that the sins of a nation, the day where the sins of families, or the whole ancestry, the whole kindred, and individuals were atoned for by the blood. During this day, the high priest, the Aaronic priesthood, would uh, go inside the temple once a year. How many times? Once a year. And they will go through the outer court, the middle court, and to the inner court, which is the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there was the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron would go with the blood of animals, usually the blood of a lamb, and repent on behalf of the sins of the nation of Israel, of families, the different 12 tribes and families of Israel. He would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat, on the ark of the covenant. He would plead for forgiveness of sins of people of Israel. This was a foreshadow, we know, of the coming of Jesus, the true Lamb of God that would later come to propitiate for our sins, to atone for our sins, not only the sins of Israel, but the sins of all men. 
A Bible chapter that has fascinated me over the years since I became a Christian is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 was written around 681 BC, 681, almost 700 years before Christ was born by Mary. To think that God showed prophet Isaiah the propitiation of our sins about 700 years before makes me to see the depth of God. That God is not like men. He is deeper than that. Then to think that God had told Moses thousands of years ago that there is a day for the propitiation of sins is deeper. What did the prophet Isaiah saw? And I can tell you that if you lived during Isaiah's time and you heard Isaiah writing these things and saying these things, you are going to say this man is running out of his mind. Because there was no one ever who filled the profile of Isaiah 53. You know that the majority of Jews today, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. But the obstacle in the Old Testament has been Isaiah 53. Because as they go to Isaiah 53 and read dito dito of this servant who's going to come and to be rejected and to suffer and to do all this, there is no prophet who fills that profile. There is no anybody whom they know in the Old Testament, not Moses, nobody except Jesus. So what they have done, some of them, they have removed Isaiah 53 from the Bible. Don't look down upon them. We do the same. We do not quote the scriptures that condemn us. We just ignore them as if they do not what? Appear in the Bible. And we quote everything that is inspirational, that encourages us. So let's not condemn them because we do the, the same. Isaiah had a revelation. 700 years before Messiah was born. He saw Messiah from the pregnancy to the current day that we are right now. And if you want to read the number of years, it's about 3,000 years. This is the reason why I respect prophets. Because if someone can see things that are going to happen in 3,000 years, what else can I do? What else can I say about that person? Because you're not going to live 3,000 years yourself. Meaning that the people of Isaiah's time, when they heard this prophecy, they could say, baloney, this is junk. Because they could not understand that he has gone beyond time. Through the Holy Spirit's revelation, for him to see the future even beyond us. Isaiah says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The word arm of the Lord is actually the Greek translation of the original. The original says, And to whom the Zohar has been revealed? The Zohar is the bone of the lamb. So in other words, he was saying, to whom the bone of the lamb has been revealed, and who come as the lamb of God. So he was talking about Jesus. Isaiah gets into the spirit, and he's seeing things that are deeper. He saw this arm of the Lord, or the bone of the lamb, being born. As a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, because the world was dry, it's sinful, but there is a tender plant that is coming. In other words, Isaiah is even seeing the pregnancy of Mary 700 years before it happens. Isaiah, he saw something. He even saw the picture of this Jesus. He has no form or comeliness. I want to hear what does your version say. What does your version of the Bible say? I want that one which is different from mine. He has no form or comeliness. I'm on verse 2. 
What does your vision say? Isaiah 53, verse 2. He has no form or comeliness. That is a new James vision. I want a different version. Amplified. What does Amplified say? So he does not show any royalness or kingly pomp. Okay, I want a different one. Do you have any different version? Okay, now speak loudly for my sake. He did not have any impressive form, his looks or majesty. He saw the Lord Jesus, that there was nothing beautiful on him, or no majestic about his physical appearance. He was an ordinary man. He was just an ordinary man. Just like perhaps you. The pictures of Jesus that have come through the generations since the Roman Empire that depict a handsome, tall, beautiful man is not Jesus. Because Isaiah did not see that. And I know sometimes when you're going through attacks and you take that picture and put it under your pillow and you think that Jesus is going to save me, he's not going to work. That's not Jesus. He saw this man despised and rejected by men. This man went through sorrows and grief. That's what he's saying. Interestingly, up to this day, Jesus is still despised and rejected by men. Some, they stand against him. Some, they despise his gift of forgiveness. Some, they persecute Christians. Persecuting Christians is persecuting Jesus. This is the reason why when Saul was killing Christians, he heard a voice and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But Saul knew that this person who is speaking is not ordinary in authority. He says, who are you Lord, and he says, I am the Lord Jesus whom you are persecuting. But in actual life, he, was he persecuting Jesus? Did he think that he was persecuting Jesus? He was persecuting. When you persecute a child of God, you are persecuting Jesus. When you persecute Christians, you are persecuting Jesus. So when persecution comes, is still the rejection of Jesus Christ. You know what's interesting in this country at this moment? People can talk about yoga and Buddhism and those interesting stuff and people say, wow, that's so cool in our meetings. People can talk about Shinto and it's funny in our meetings. People can talk about anything else in the school. The sooner you talk about Jesus, Someone has to report you to the dean or going upwards. He was talking about religion. Religion is not supposed to be talked about in the public place. That's persecuting Jesus. So, here is the prophet of God who is seen to the yonder. They are rejecting him. They are despising him. And we still do. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes did not esteem him. He says he was not esteemed. He was regarded as a street, a vagabond preacher who did not have a church who was just moving in the streets from one place to the other preaching. They did not respect him. They respected the, the rabbis of the day. They respected the scribes and the Pharisees who would come dressed in a certain way. But this man, they did not esteem him. Isaiah is saying this. Yet, when he attracted thousands of people because of his teaching, they plotted to kill him. Yet it was God's plan for him to bear 
our grief. That's what Isaiah is saying. It was the purpose of God for him to go through that. It was the plan of God so that he can bear our grief. He can carry our souls. That's why he started to say, if he is the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was crucified, stricken and afflicted. That's what the, the word that he used. He didn't use the word crucified. He was stricken and afflicted by God. Five, why? He was wounded for our transgression. This day, the day of atonement, is the day of our transgressions. He was wounded for that very reason, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was chastised for our peace. He was striped by stripes for our healing. He was the propitiation for our sins. He was atoning for our sins. This is the reason why, even before Jesus came into the picture, because God knows that there's only one way that sins can be forgiven, and it is through the blood. He had to say to, the, to Moses, tell the children of Israel, because I love them. I want them not to have any sin. And the only way that they can take, take away sin, it is through the blood. The day of atonement, which God told Moses, to partake and celebrate over a thousand years, thousands of years ago, ahead of time. Prophet Isaiah saw it later on about 700 years ago, and it was fulfilled with Jesus when he came in the New Testament at Calvary, the place of the skull, which is Golgotha in Hebrew. For he atoned for our sins there. He used his cross to nail our curses, Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now listen, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ. Also that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So he's nailing by the cross where for two reasons. The washing away of our sins, the blood that was shed by the cross, the breaking of the curse which follows humanity, and also that we receive the promise of the Spirit. I, there's a verse that I also want to read. I think it's in Colossians. Colossians, like that verse. Let me read Colossians 2 um, from verse 18. And you being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The reason why he died. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, other version says, the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it on the cross. What is being called here the handwritings of requirements, the law. He stood on it. And he nailed anything that stand against us by his cross. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over principalities and powers of darkness. And this is what Galatians is saying. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, the handwriting of the ordinances which stood against us because cursed is everyone who hangeth on a tree. I will talk about this a little later. This year, 2021, that we're getting into is the year of breaking of the curse. It is the year of the breaking 
of the case. If you are going by the Hebrew calendar, it means that the year has started to what? Break the case. It is a window of opportunity to break the case. You choose to use that window or you choose to leave it to close. That's up to you. But there's a window that is opened that you can enter. Uh, ETSU is doing some very novel stuff and I, it's interesting to see how leadership does things. Uh, because of coronavirus and the fear that the numbers are going to go down, not ETSU only, but many investors, but I'm just talking for ETSU because we are here. And I remember MTSU says, oh, you know what? Come to our university. We no longer require GRE. Just come to our university. And GRE, I mean, it's a little bit tough of an exam. Those who have written it, you know what I'm talking about. You wrote it more than 10 years ago, twice. That's enough for you to know. Why did I write it twice? Then they say, no, you no longer come to our university. You don't, we don't need ACT, SAT scores. Just, just come to do undergrad. What has happened is a window of opportunity. That is what opened. It's up to you to enter or not to enter. Sometimes in life, windows of opportunities, they open. And when the windows of opportunities, they opened, you have to have discernment and to understand things in the spirit that the window of opportunity has now opened. I have to enter. If you choose not to enter at that particular time, you may take a little bit of time before that window of opportunity opens again. So this year is the year of the breaking of the curse. I, I want you to know this information to equip you so that you can develop a strategy between now and December to know how to pray as you move through this year. You know your kindred. You know your genealogy. You know some things that stands there. They need to be broken. And you are going to use the blood of Jesus to break them. But someone has to break them. Are you following? The fact that Jesus died for us, it did not make everybody a Christian. You have to confess with your mouth you have to repent and you have to receive him. But he died for us, right? The fact that Jesus died, curses do not just automatically break. You have now to use the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, to break them. And a window is opened for you. The day of atonement is a day to remember, a day to celebrate, a day to reflect the work of Jesus in atoning our sins, in breaking the cases, in transferring the blessing of Abraham to you and me, and in releasing the promise of the Holy Spirit. It goes back to what I said. Why the Bible says the blessing of Ar Abraham? Because he has one set of blessings upon humanity. And he who blesses Abraham will be blessed. And he who curses Abraham and his kindred will be cursed. And he who receive Christ Jesus, he can now partake the blessings of Abraham through faith and the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I go to the Old Testament. I go to Deuteronomy 27 and 29, where there's a litany of curses and blessings. I go and receive all the blessings which were spoken to the kindred of Abraham, I partake them because I am in Christ, through Christ. Why Jesus said to atone for us, Isaiah 53 verse 6 continues, Oh, we were like sheep, have gone astray, everyone turned his own way. So God had to lay on his servant all our iniquity. The method which was used by God to redeem us, to purchase us, if you may like, to serve humanity, was not what the Jewish people wanted or desired or was thinking about or was imagining. Because remember, they had heard about this servant who was going to come to redeem them and to serve them. And they thought he's going to come so powerful and he's going to dispose all the Romans 
who were terrorizing them. And they were looking at signs and times. When is this servant coming? And they thought he is going to be powerful. They knew David, who was a powerful leader, who hit his enemies as fine as dust. So they think that the one that is coming out of David, the one which was prophesied over and over, he is going to come and is going to be so powerful. Contrary to human pride and worldly ways, God chose to bring that king as a suffering servant and as a humble servant. Contrary to what they were thinking about. God often uses ways that we do not expect. Instead of a mighty king like David coming to set the Jewish people free from the Roman dictatorship, as they imagined, God brought a humble and suffering Messiah. His strength was shown by humility, by suffering, and by mercy. Let, let, let me just drop something in your spirit. Sometimes we imagine things and we want things to work the way that we imagine. And if you are just limited by your imagination, you are going to miss the mark. You know, when I was growing up, I, growing, I grew up in a southern African country called Zimbabwe. The way that I grew up in the village and finally going to the boarding schools and finally going to the city and going to, going to the university. In my mind, I was limited to marry a Shona-speaking girl because I was Shona-speaking. We have few languages. Two men is Shona and Debele. And we thought the Debele are bad people. So if you want to marry a good woman, you have to marry a Shona. And I happen to come from the Shona tribe. So we thought we are the better ones. Every tribe thinks that way. Daddy had one, two, three. Things did not work out. Did not see things the same way. Break up. Some they ran away from me. Some I ran away from them. <laughs> Whatever happened first. Came to America. When I was doing my master's, it was a 99.99% .99 white university. There were few ladies who were so enamored by me. Didn't work out. Didn't think that. So my mind was, in my imagination, I am going to meet a Shona-speaking lady or a lady-speaking Shona, whatever comes first. That's the person that I'm going to marry. That's my imagination. Then God, in his own wisdom, brought Pastor Dumisa into my life. She is not a Shona-speaking lady or a lady-speaking Shona. She speaks few languages that I do not understand. I speak few languages that she doesn't understand. And our common language was English. Thank God for English, all. So what I'm saying here, sometimes you have imaginations and you are in captivity of your imaginations. And you are limited by your imaginations. I am going to make a business because I am a medical doctor. I am going to make a farmer's business. And yet God wants you to trade in coffee and become a multi-millionaire through coffee. Not nothing to do with the medical field. Don't be limited by our imagination. I'm talking to young people who are still imagining about life. And I'm speaking to you directly with love. And don't limit yourself to imagination. If you can limit yourself to revelation, that's better. Because that's what the Lord has spoken. But we limit ourselves so much to imagination. Let me tell you, when I was doing my undergrad, I did an undergrad with a double major. It was the first time in my country to introduce an undergrad with a double major. It was an undergrad in education, but you'll be teaching these subjects. So it was Bachelor of Arts with Education. Some they call it Bachelor of Education with Arts. It was the first time for that to be introduced in our country. So I had to choose two subjects. One of the subjects that I'd done consistently up to A level was history. So world history is my cup of tea. 
enjoy history. I think you see that the way that I preach, I go to the history. I'm so much fascinated with the history. I want to understand the past before I understand the present and the future. Then the other subject, which was introduced for the first time in my country at a degree level, was music and African culture. I don't sing that much. I like singing. I play a few instruments. I just did that, that, that subject just to fill up the two. I'm just being honest. Because the person who was teaching geograph was making geograph like a science subject. So I didn't like that part. So I just took music and African culture. I remember talking to my friend who was in Virginia. I said, over my dead body, when I finish this degree, I will not teach music. I will not do anything to do with music. I just did music as a placeholder for me just to finish this degree. Imagination. I'm captured by my imagination. I got an opportunity to come to America to do what? To start music. The very one that I said I will never do anything to do with it is just a placeholder. A door opened for that. So sometimes our imagination becomes our captivity. I want you to imagine again. Uh, mainly those people who limit themselves, who say, me, I mean, from the way I grew up, where I come from, with an accent that I have, I cannot amount to be anything. I, I think I can go up to here, but I don't think I can go up to there. Just like in my dream, we had gone up to here. And I was looking forward to go to the other level. May the Lord take everyone who's under my voice this morning to another level. Prophet Isaiah is prophesying. And during the process of the atonement of Jesus, this is what he's seeing 700 years before it happens. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep to its shearers is silent. We read from John 19. Pontius Pilate is asking him his questions. Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And he keeps quiet. He only answered the challenge that, oh no, you don't have any power. Don't think that you have, because you are a king of power. You can only have power that is given from above. But all along, he was quiet. When he was now going to Calvary, when they were beating him now, when Pilate had given them to him, they were beating him, they were blindfolding him, then they beat him. Says, you say you are a prophet. Prophesy, we have done this. You know, they were whipping him, and they were beating him, and he was quiet. Some of you, if I can just take a needle and come close to you with a needle, you don't even trust me as your pastor. You'll be like, oh, pastor, no, 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 no. Don't come too close to me because you are holding a, a needle. Now think someone who is being whipped and he is silent. He is quiet. They mocked him. They beat him. They pierced him, and he remained silent. That's exactly what Isaiah had seen 700 years ahead of time. Let me finish up. Five minutes. Verse 8. Verse eight. He was taken from prison to judgment. He was taken from Pilate, right to be crucified. He has seen that. His grave was made with the wicked. And he says he was numbered with the transgressors. And you know that they crucified him. There's one thief to the right, one thief to the left. Isaiah saw it 700 years ahead of time. But with the rich at his death, what does that mean? There was a rich man who was Joseph of Arimathea who had hewn his own grave. So he was buried in the rich one's grave. Isaiah had seen it 700 years ahead of time. Isaiah 53, verse 10 to 12. They reinforced 
the atonement of sins. What he did. What did he say? He poured his soul as an offering for sin. That's what he did for us. He atoned for us. He shall justify many and bear the iniquities. That's what we read from Galatians, from Colossians. He poured his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many. Today and right now, Jesus is making intercession. He is sitting by the right hand of the Father, making intercession. That's what the Bible says, right? He intercedes for us. Isaiah saw that. Isaiah saw that. But to his kindred, to his generation, when he's prophesying these words, they, 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 they ignored him. Ah, who are you talking about? Moses, because they think Moses is the big deal. Moses, our father, did not die for anybody, was not crucified, was not afflicted. That, you know, Abraham, our father, died a long time ago. So who are you talking about? Up to now... They are still vexed by the very same verse, same scripture, Isaiah 53. I want to encourage you to revisit Isaiah 53 and see the work of Jesus prophesied. And if you go to John 19, you see him now going through what Isaiah had prophesied. To all our Lord Jesus Christ atoned for our sins. It is therefore proper to use this day of atonement to remember him, to ask for forgiveness for our sins. It is proper to do that. Of the new covenant in his blood, he is atonement so that we are forgiven. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. If you go to Leviticus 23, God was saying, do these things in remembrance of me. When you now go to Corinthians, Jesus still says, do this in remembrance of me. It is proper to remember him. He is suffering. He is shedding of his blood. He did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for your family. He did that for your ancestry. So now you can go to your ancestry and say, Father, my parents were involved, my ancestors were involved in slave trading because those slaves were taken to the market by, by people, by our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So you are going to say, and, and, and as they were doing that, holding this person to, to, to the market, they were releasing cases up to your kindred, up to your genealogy. That follows you. Those cases until someone stands to confess them as sin, to repent them, and to break them, they still stand. It's just like receiving Jesus. You don't receive Jesus because he died for us. You have to receive him by saying, Jesus, come into my heart. I confess my sin. I repent. I want us to stand up and reflect. And I'm going to ask you to do this. And it's optional. I just choose to do it myself. The day of atonement starts 6 p.m. today because God counts from evening to evening, from sundown to sundown, and it finishes tomorrow, 6 p.m. What I'm choosing to do, I'm choosing to fast, as it was said in the Bible. I'm just choosing to do that. And I'm just choosing to fast from 6 to 6. I'm going to have a big meal at 4 so that by 6, I'm okay. From 6 to 6, I'm just choosing to fast. What I'm going to do, I'm going just to have some time that I sit alone or as my family and say, what runs into our family? What are the trends that runs into our family? There are some trends that runs into our family. Can I tell you, even pastors, you see pastors falling into the same sin that the whole world is falling into because it's, it runs into... Families. I told you about my family, which is a number of pastors. And uh, they messed up big time. Why did they were pastors? Because there's something that runs into that bloodline. So I want, I want to, to write all those things. And I want to bring those things before the Lord. And I'm going to ask for the atonement of those sins. And by 6 p.m. tomorrow, I'm going to take Holy Communion and say, Lord, 
because of what the shed blood, because of what you did at Calvary. I'm remembering it. And I'm asking you, Father, to break all these curses because also it's a window of breaking curses that has opened. Break each and every curse that runs from my ancestry, runs in my life. Some of the sins were not done by my ancestors. They were done by by me, the very me. I'm bringing all that before the Lord and said, Lord, if I say I am without sin, I'm a liar. And I make you a liar, as the Bible says. All you fall short of the glory of God. And we all need to confess and repent and go before the Lord. And he is faithful and just to do what? To forgive our sins and our transgressions and our iniquity and our, our trespasses. He is faithful to do that. I choose to do that today. Never done it, but I want just to do it in this window. Just believing, remember, for walking with, with the Lord is faith, right? So I'm doing it out of faith and just believing that the Lord is going to break some things and I am free to move forward. I want us to pray. I don't know what this word is said to you. Before we take the Holy Communion, which is the atonement of Christ Jesus, I want you just to pray. If there is any case that you know that runs in your family, even that which you have confessed in the past, even that which you have prayed about in the past, bring it again. There's no harm in breaking it again in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus.